Hello and welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer. For this week's Q&A, we're joined by Cyril Tushi with his film about the rise and fall of Mikhail Khodorkovsky, once Russia's richest man, he became its most famous prisoner. It's an amazing documentary in which Khodorkovsky demonstrates one surefire way to get into a Russian prison. The corruption in Russia is valued by four organizations in the region of 30 million dollars. And the director worried that making a film about Khodorkovsky might also be the second best way into Russia's prison system. Before every meeting I put out the battery out of the phone because I heard that then you are not able to be tapped. Also on the show. A comedy about what happens when the newly selected Pope decides he's not up to the job. But first, this year, a delegation of Egyptians were invited to the Cannes International Film Festival to premiere their collective film about the 18 days that changed their country. Eighteen Days mixes scripted scenes with real-life footage to tell stories of everyday life during the uprising. This wasn't just independent filmmaking, no budget, volunteer crews and a revolution. Yeah. How do you even... Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> How do you even begin? We've always been taught that Egypt will never revolt, that democracy was not po uh, possible. <laughs> what you saw on Tahrir Square was another possibility for Egypt to exist, and it functions, it works. And I think this is what made us all enthusiastic about it. It started out as being really uh, people who were, who were living uh, through something extremely, extremely uh, powerful, emotional, uh, important, and who wanted to leave a trace. Nasrallah's film takes us inside the demonstrations. One of the phrases that really touched me at the beginning of, of your short was the words irresistibly driven. These people were irresistibly driven to going on the streets. And yeah, hating yourself if you, didn't, if, you, if you didn't go to the street. I think that it's true. The irresistibility of the revolution, of going out and everything, is to come out, you know, of sort of uh, repressive, oppressive uh, um, confinement. <laughs> Ashraf Saberto tells the story of a barber whose shop is turned into a field hospital. When the flood hits you, looks at those who profited from the uprising. What was essentially great about both of your short stories was that you were showing quintessential Egyptians. The movie is expressing how exactly the Egyptian felt in the 18 days, especially the 18 days. We, we're not expressing the revolution. Because the, the revolution is still revolution, going on. The revolution just started. Most of uh, of the Egyptian was waiting for something to happen. But we were a little bit afraid of, especially we thought that it will come from the Islamic. And no one was expecting how peaceful the revolution will be. Well, I guess that we were, we didn't surprise the world as much as we surprised, our, Ourself. surprised ourselves. Mariam Abouraouf's short focuses on February 2nd, when Mubarak supporters paid thugs to attack protesters. Harbi! <laughs> Ali! 
Ali. Curfew follows Ali and his grandfather, Ali. who get lost in the streets of Swiss. Where do you stand now with what's going on? What do you hope for? Everything is collapsed now in Egypt. System and even the cinema industry, everything. And now it's our role to to reformatting it in the future as we as we want it. And we have to rebuild it from scratch and we have to stay as one entity, one hand, one group to do so. And if we start to divide, it's never ever gonna happen. We're gonna be just fragmented and it's gonna be the end. <laughs> تضحك علي ولا؟ عليك ولا؟ Washing the dead in an Austrian morgue isn't everyone's idea of great fun, but it's a wild party compared to life in an Austrian jail. Veteran Austrian actor Karl Markowitz. Nummer 75,570. Salomon Zorovich is perhaps best known for his portrayal of a Machiavellian master forger in the Oscar-winning The Counterfeiters. After nearly 30 years of acting on TV, stage and screen, he's taken the plunge into directing with breathing. A coming-of-age story of an 18-year-old inmate in a juvenile detention center. Why did you make the move from, from acting to directing? I always felt that there is, there is more I want to do. I always had stories in my mind and I always had the feeling that uh, one day uh, I, I want to, to write my own stories and to direct them. You must have to and and move it out. Novice actor Thomas Schubert plays Roman Kogler. Institutionalized since childhood, he struggles with guilt and isolation after causing the death of another boy. He finds a day release job at the municipal morgue in Vienna to increase his chances of getting parole and perhaps finding salvation. I want to make a film about the guys, the coroners, the guys in the funeral uh, service. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, undertakers, undertakers, coroners, yeah, yeah, undertakers. Undertakers, because we have many folk songs about death and it's very romantic and sentimental and things like that. I always felt it's just because people are afraid, of course, of the real death mm. and of to, to think about what is when everything ends. What was the process there to create such a kind of authentic story world? I had much research because I didn't know uh, the, uh, the, the job of an undertaker. I never have been into prison, so the people were they are really kind and, and helpful to let me see all this. I even uh, worked with them for several days. It was one of the strongest experiences I ever had in my life because I have never seen a dead body before. And this really changed my view upon life. And this was very important to write into my ma main character because it's his experience, of course, as well. Watch him, he's a Christlicher. Fast. He's developing from a guy who has no skills for life and no sense for life. And to develop into a guy who gets a just kind of sense for life. To see that, char that that's character arc there with the most subtle acting. And, I mean, he's a young guy, you're, he's you're 18, an actor. So he's 18, he How never, was that? This was really a gift for us to find him. It's, 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 
gestolpert oder was? I knew from my son this this age, especially when you are 18, you, in, sometimes you, you are a child and sometimes you are a grown-up and it changes all the time. Everybody. Welcome to this fabulous picture show, Q&A. Please, will you welcome Cyril Tushi. He's brought his film, Hordakoski. <laughs> Five years in the making, and it's not the film you intended to make. Well, I wanted to make about Hordakoski a fiction film because to me it had a, or has a very Shakespearean mm. dimension. And when I came back to Moscow the second, third time, I found out that all my scripted fantasy was not as powerful and strong as reality, and so I started with the documentary. Enjoy the film, and we'll see you for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. In 2003, Russia's richest man, Mikhail Hordakovsky, was arrested in dramatic fashion <laughs> and sent to fester in a Siberian jail allegedly for not paying tax to the Russian government. Then headed by Vladimir Putin. Cyril Tushi's stylish political documentary combines interviews from those closest to the celebrated criminal case. And with 3D animation charts the rise and fall of Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Handed billions in the Russian economic boom of the 90s. Khodorkovsky made a deal with Yeltsin, so he got some 5 billion for free. Mikhail Khodorkovsky gained wealth and notoriety with his oil giant, Yukos. I went to interview him and, and said, what does it feel like to be the richest man in the world? Under 40. When a new president appeared on the block. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. He wanted to make sure that Russian billionaires towed the line. Putin told them, okay, guys, please stay away from the politics, okay? And everybody agreed. Everybody nodded to say, okay. And Khodorkovsky nodded as well. But Khodorkovsky dared to back the political opposition and to publicly confront Putin. Масштабы коррупции в России оцениваемы экспертами четырех организаций, кого в районе 30 миллиардов оценивается долларов. And when the stakes were raised. И ваша компания, допустим, у нее были проблемы с уплатой налогов. He refused to run scared. Я еще раз говорю, я политэмигрантом не буду. And paid the price. Khodorkovsky doesn't believe that tax evasion was his real crime. I think the main reason is because I supported the political opposition. And was brought to court again in 2009. Khodorkovsky is accused of stealing 350 million barrels of his own oil. Before he was found guilty, seeing him kept behind bars until 2017, the filmmakers managed to do the impossible. I see a lot of laughing. Why do you call the accusations absurd? Get an interview with the prisoner himself что когда нас обвиняют в похищении физическом 350 миллионов тонн нефти, то это невозможно не только доказать, это себе просто невозможно представить. Это железнодорожный состав, который огибает землю три раза по экватору. When he takes on Putin like that, I mean, how many people in Russia just think that this is what it was about? It was just the richest guy in Russia takes on supposedly the most powerful guy and loses. I asked Khodorkovsky himself, what is the reason why you're in prison? I think p between Putin and Khodorkovsky there was some, something personal. He was the richest, the most beautiful and the fastest guy. We even created a little animation like Putin and Khodorkovsky in a, in a playground to show this kind of uh, childish uh, log logic behind it. But we deleted this animation. But he didn't have any 
political ambition? I mean, it wasn't like he wanted to enter politics, was it? 100% I don't know if Khodorkovsky wanted to become president or not, but I know that he wanted to influence the country to, to the better, to the better for his company, yeah. but also to the better for education and uh, the whole people. And I think he had a higher aim than becoming president. He wanted to really, I think, save Russia. <laughs> Nothing less. You really think he just considered himself a great citizen of Russia? A savior. A savior of Russia? That 10-minute interview that you have with Khodorkovsky is incredibly pivotal to this film. They hadn't yeah. had an interview with him since 2003, six years later. You're in a courtroom, you have the chance. And your creative producer says, ask the judge, yeah? It was a miracle. We, uh, you know, all the journalists in the courtroom didn't even think that there is such a possibility. And that always something which strikes you, why don't we try? I simply went to the judge. He said, we don't give interviews to journalists. I said, we are not journalists. We are filmmakers. <laughs> we are doing documentary. And we're filming outside. I was having a cigarette. All of a sudden, Khodorkovsky lawyers running. Quickly, quickly, you're given 10 minutes. And nobody believed that we got this 10 minutes. So tell us about that 10 minutes and, and did you have all those questions prepared and no? No, when fine. they said yes, I uh, suddenly I lost all my questions <laughs> and, and my cameraman was not there this day. So I had so to... You had to shoot. So I had to focus myself and I was happy that I was not focusing on the glass but on his face. If you would have a time machine and could travel back in time, would you change something? Знаете, есть такая э, поговорка, что умный человек находит выход из ситуации, а мудрый в нее не попадает. Ну, возможно, я был недостаточно мудрым. If he is such a great threat to Putin, and Putin is so powerful and so autocratic, wouldn't he have just got rid of him some other way? Wouldn't have there been an accident? The intelligent thing in Russia is that you give the appearance of a modern state. And if you want to give the appearance of a modern state with a functioning legal system, you cannot just kill people because they annoy you. You have to do something more clever, even if it gives you more trouble. But it is a fascinating image, don't you think, to see somebody of, of once having that stature paralyzed behind bars and almost silenced. I mean, there was something hugely humiliating, I thought, in, in that image. <laughs> You, as a, somebody who didn't come from a non-investigative journalistic background, this couldn't have been an easy film to make, and, and particularly your safety must have been questioned at times. Before every meeting, I put out the battery out of the phone because I heard that then you are not able to be tapped. Because when you turn off the phone, you're still able to be tapped. Uh, and uh, even I bought a USB stick for my computer, which simulates every two seconds a different IP address. So when I send emails and surf, people cannot detect my whatever. So I did this hyper fear James Bond action. Well, I have gerade im uh, Spiegel Online gelesen, dass Litvinenko, ex FSB, dass der jetzt vergiftet wird in London. <coughs> I immediately searched my room, opening all plug sockets and fire alarms to check for bugs. If you had a level of paranoia, you couldn't be blamed. In fact, less than two weeks before it was premiering at the Berlinale, your film gets stolen. The film got stolen twice, one, one time in, in Bali and one time in Berlin. But when it, the film got stolen for the second time in Berlin, the office got broken and five doors got opened and five computers got stolen. In the audience, when we had premiere in Berlin, almost everybody thought it was Russia or the KGB. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it was just people who like Macintosh computers, so. <laughs> Emails from Germany come flooding in. Come back, don't touch the tea, etc. The other's nervousness rubs off on me too. You've been accused of uh, people paying for you to do this film, yes, no, on the record? Yeah, definitely everybody thinks, of course, I mean, more in Russia than in, in, in Europe, that uh, I was paid by either Khodorkovsky or by Putin. Okay. <laughs> but it's the German tax money we just spent. 
The people at the Kremlin fear I will seek revenge when I get out of prison. These clueless types only accuse others according to their own parameters. You can relax. I am not going to turn into the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, did some of the people who you interviewed in Russia uh, tell you whether Khodorkovsky has a political future in, in Russia? Khodorkovsky uh, always says and writes that he will not go into politics but takes care of his family. He, is, uh, he neglected um, so for so long and maybe invests in natural energy resources, uh, yeah, green energy, whatever. As they're sitting in prison, he's bound to say that at that, this moment. But exactly. <laughs> well, you're right. You always have to take in respect that you're in prison. But maybe he will get back even, yeah? Nobody knows. У Ходорковского, конечно, есть будущее. Если Ходорковский так сложится, выйдет на свободу, он будет, безусловно, лидером оппозиции. If he's ever released, what message will this send to the world, do you think? Well, for many outside uh, politicians and businessmen, uh, the freeing or not freeing of Khodorkovsky is a litmus test for being able to invest again in Russia and to to communicate on a normal base with Russia. So it's the, everybody's looking on this symbol, and I think Putin and Medvedev, they are quite aware of this power or possible power, or Medvedev can use it to uh, show that he is a Western-oriented president. So. Uh, it could be could could happen if they use this card. Everybody, can we please thank Cyril for bringing his film here, Khodorkovsky. Thanks a lot. К сожалению, пока в нашей стране не построено до конца гражданское общество, никто не может быть уверен в том, что его не будут ждать люди с наручником. Habermus Papam is a cheeky peek backstage at the Vatican's selection of a new Pope. <laughs> it focuses on a fictional character, Cardinal Melville, who, when elected to lead a billion Catholics at the head of the church, has a crisis of confidence and flees the Vatican before taking office. Même pour les personnes, uh, non -croyantes. Even people who are not religious wonder about the Pope. We almost expect him to have passion and energy beyond our capabilities. Buongiorno, come va? Come si sente? Scusi, non so cosa dire. Va bene, non si preoccupi. Italian director Nanni Moretti cast himself as the eminent psychoanalyst called in to counsel Melville. Bene, cominciamo. Grazie a tutti. Grazie. His attempts to delve into Melville's psyche are hampered by the dogmatic deacons. Senta. Ha problemi con la fede. And when Melville steals away to Rome to do some soul searching. The sequestered Moretti turns his avuncular attentions to the rest of the cardinals. Oh, ma questo è un tranquillante maggiore. Questo è forte. Chi lo prende? Chi lo prende questo? Far from the scathing satire of the church expected of Moretti, Habermas Papam focuses on the reality of religious responsibility and the nature of leaders and followers. E che lavoro fa? Cosa faccio? Sì. Faccio l'attore. Well, that's it for this fabulous picture show. It was quite heated, very exciting Q&A, but what are you going to do next? You had enough of investigative journalism? Well, I think I will make, have a break and then I will do fiction, more fa fairy tale wise and then for sure I will go back to documentary. Sometime. Fiction, fairy tale. What does that mean? Well, we'll see next year. <laughs> I will shoot. But it doesn't sound dangerous at least. <laughs> exactly, that's what I want. <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, how would you rate this film and why? I'd say about seven and a half. Possibly eight and a half. Nine point nine recurring. Well, I mean, to be honest, I'm kind of still thinking about it. It's very thought-provoking. He's one of the richest guys in the world and then in jail with nothing. So it's sort of a fascinating 21st century story. It wasn't sort of leaning too much in one direction, which is good. Well, I love the animation particularly. He will be the leader of the country. I can see that now and I could only 
I can only see it thanks to the insights offered by the film, so 11 out of 10.